Well, yes, Lucy, not do I believe so. The interior minister, he has gone public to say that my life is in danger. Uh, but he says it's from some foreign uh, elements. But I know that it is from uh, actually the government itself. The, there were three main people in the government who were responsible, uh, I believe, were responsible for my assassination attempt. I predicted that about six weeks before the attempt took place. So they are still sitting in government. They have sabotaged the, in, the inquiry report because it was implicating them. And, and I think that they are more threatened than ever because they feel since my party is now overwhelmingly uh, a favorite to win the elections, they feel that uh, they feel more threatened and they feel that if I come back to power, then I would hold them accountable. Well, you know, Lucy, there was threat to my life. Uh, and I went on public claiming that uh, that how they would tr try to assassinate me, that they would palm it off on a religious fanatic who would claim that I had uh, committed blasphemy. And how did I know that? Because three and a half years I was in power and I had obviously the intelligence agencies were working with me. So I got information from within the agencies that this is what they were planning to do. I went public and according to the script, they actually, that's exactly what they did. They palmed it off on a religious fanatic who, who, who shot, uh, uh, you know, who shot at me and a lot of uh, 12 of our people got injured. But fortunately there was one, bystander who saw him pull out the gun and just in the nick of time he put his hand on the gun so rather than hitting us on the top body it, it, the the bullets hit us on the legs and but there were two other shooters and this was confirmed by the uh, the joint investigating committee which which uh, uh, you know which came up with forensics and eyewitnesses and confirmed that there were three shooters so after that the uh, the powerful quarters because there was the intelligence agency general who was involved in this. I nominated him, the interior minister, who recently again has made a statement that it's either us or, you know, something like about, um, you know, uh, 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 either it was us or them or some stupid statement he's made. And then, of course, the prime minister, all of them have been involved in extrajudicial killing and there's a record about them. So. The, they were still sitting in power and they sabotaged the findings of the of the uh, of the joint investigative committee now since they are still in power and since my party has won 30 by elections out of 37 in the last few months they know that we are favorites to win the elections and therefore my life is uh, you know more at risk now because because uh, they are they're petrified that I would be back in power. Well, Lucy, what's happened is that since, uh, uh, you know, we were, uh, we were deposed from power and that this was uh, the, the person behind it was the army chief. The, uh, you know, as you know, the establishment is all powerful with the intelligence agencies. So he was the one who, who was uh, behind the plot, but he co-opted the guys who are in power right now, you know, these 12 party alliance. So, since then, what they hoped was that the, my party would just sort of wither away because once a party is out of power, you know, people turn their backs on it. But for the first time in our history, something unprecedented happened. Hundreds and thousands of people came out on the 10th of April. My government was removed on the 9th, 10th of April. Hundreds and thousands of people came out on the streets. Now, when that happened, the, everyone was taken by shock, including the establishment. So rather than the popularity going down, with time, the, my popularity and my party soared to heights, which no party in Pakistan's history is as popular as uh, my party PTI is right now. Therefore, that's when this plot was hatched to have me removed. And, you know, us winning 30 out of 37 by-elections meant that my life was even more in danger as time went on because elections are due. The, the Supreme Court had asked for uh, the provincial elections on the 30th of April. The general elections take place in October. Now they're all scared that in these two provincial uh, elections on the 30th, we would win. So they're challenging in, in the Supreme Court right now. 
They're scared of elections. And so the two are related, you know, the threat to my life and elections and coming to power are all related. Well, you know, Lucy, let me just uh, put the record straight. There are 140 cases against me right now, which include blasphemy, which includes uh, sedition, uh, which includes 40 cases of terrorism, 40 cases. Now, remember, this country has known me for 50 years. I am the probably the most the longest known Pakistani and the well-known Pakistani, you know, in, in five decades. So no one believes that I have broken the law because I've never broken the law in my life. In fact, my movement is called Movement for Justice, Rule of Law. So none of all these cases, whenever they go to a trial court, I get bail because they, there's nothing in the cases. I mean, for instance, I'm accused of uh, terrorism. Now, how am I accused? My party does... Some party members do a, a peaceful demonstration outside the uh, election commission. I'm sitting in another city and I'm charged with terrorism. Or we go, I go and attend a, make a court appearance. And so there are a lot of followers there. We go in and come out and there are three terrorism cases. So, it's, so no one believes this. And whenever they, it goes to court, they get set aside. Look, Lu Lucy, never in our history has anyone had 140 cases against me. And the rate it's going, I'm soon about to score my double century. Uh, the, the problem is that, you know, the cases they are slapping against me, no one believes them. Now, for instance, the, the corruption, so-called corruption case, what is it? For 70 years, the law in Pakistan is that whether it's the prime minister, the ministers or any generals, whenever they get a gift, it has to go to something what is called Tosha Khana. There, they decide the value of the gift. Then they give you an opportunity. Do you want to retain it? If you retain it in the past, it used to be 20% used to pay and you used to take the gift. Mm -hmm. Now, in my time, it was 50%. So this is the law. Everything is on record. So whenever this case goes into court, this will be again dismissed. Uh, Lucy, look, let me again, uh, let me correct the record again. My people have never indulged in violence. And I'll tell you why. A party that wants elections does not want violence because violence is one thing that would delay the elections. Now, we've been asking for elections. The, the government parties do not want elections. So they have been blaming, blaming security. One is lack of funds and the other is security situation for delaying the elections. Now, if we were indulging in violence, we would actually be helping the government's narrative about lack of security. So my people have all, always been told that we do not want to have any clash or any violence. Now, you, you talked about my social media active, you know, my, the guy who was my advisor, Azhar Mashwani. Then our social media head in the southern province of Sin, they have both been abducted. We do not know their whereabouts. They have disappeared for, for seven days. But this is not the only situation. In the last seven months, my chief of staff was abducted. He faced custodial torture. He was stripped naked. He was tortured. He was a professor from the U.S., you know, who came back to help me. Then my Senator Azam Swati, this is all on media. You can Google it. He was picked up for tweeting. He made one tweet against General Bajwa. And on that tweet, they picked him up. They beat him up in front of his grandchildren first. Then they took him to another place where they again stripped him naked, they tortured him. And this is all documented. So why are the supporters worried when the police comes with an illegal? There was no arrest warrant. This was an abduction. They all came to pick me up. The supporters were worried that they were going to, I would again disappear, abducted and tortured. So this is, a, and, and then they know that these are the same people who tried to kill me. Hence, you see the worry amongst my supporters. They have never attacked the police. The police attacked my house with an illegal arrest. They came to, to pick me up. And from three sides, there were rangers, there were police, there was an armored car. For 24 hours, my house was under attack. And what you saw, what you call violence, when the police attacked them with tear gas shelling and pellet guns and God knows what, this water cannon with chemicals, there was resistance. And why was there resistance? By the way, there were three times I told my supporters, look, I'm going to go and give myself up. 
they would not allow me to give myself up because they were all scared that they would either kill me in prison or they would just, you know, there are so many cases, they would just keep me for months. So there is no confidence in the government right now amongst my supporters. But they do not go and attack the police. In fact, 2,000 of my supporters are in jail right now. Our social media people have been picked up. The, if you look at what has happened to uh, 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 the media, there's a total clampdown on media. There's a blackout. Uh, the only reason they're going after social media because the mainstream media has blacked me out. And so social media is what now they are cracking down so that I, I have no visibility at all. Well, look, you know, the reason why they supported why this whole thing happened was when the police came to pick me up, they asked them, you know, why, why have you come to pick me up? And they came up with this warrant that they wanted to produce me in court. But the law says that when I was uh, when I gave them a, an assurity, my lawyer gave them a surety guarantee that I would appear in the court. They can't. The, the, the law is very clear. It's, there's Section 75, 76 of the law, which says if you give them an assurity guarantee, they can't pick you up. Because and as, as it happened, I went and appeared in front of the court on the on the on that date. OK, so they knew that this was what they were doing was abduction. That's why there was resistance. But, you know. What do I tell my supporters? That it is in our interest that there is uh, there's no violence because we want elections. It is in the interest of the government, which is trying to bring the security situation as an excuse to run away from the elections. Sorry, what did you mean? What What is my... Now, Lucy, look, we will sweep the elections and all the opinion polls uh, say that and... and and the results yeah. of the by-elections out of 37, and we've swept 30, despite the establishment and the entire government machinery helping them. That's why they don't want elections. But look, what we need in Pakistan most of all is rule of law. Look, the difference between rich and poor countries is only one. Rich countries have rule of law and the, hence prosperity. And our countries are plundered by their own ruling elites because they're above law. This is the struggle, not just in Pakistan. It's in the entire developing world where you find these poor refugees trying to, you know, risking their lives to go to uh, the land of milk and honey like Europe and England. Why? Because there's rule of law. So they have level playing field. In our countries, unfortunately, the elite is above law. And this is the whole struggle going on in Pakistan. They've all ganged up against me. Twelve parties have ganged up against me. So the entire political spectrum is on one side helped by the establishment, which also has always been above law. So this is a struggle for rule of law. And if you do, if you have rule of law, then that is what brings prosperity because it brings investment. Our biggest asset in, uh, for Pakistan are the overseas Pakistanis, which are 10 million. And their combined GDP is more than the GDP of 220 million Pakistanis. If we can have the enabling environment for them to invest in this country, Pakistan will stand on its own feet. I mean, I'm just giving you a, a very rough idea that unless you have rule of law, you cannot have prosperity because, uh, you know, we get robbed by our own elites who siphon off money and it ends up in Western uh, capitals and in offshore accounts. And as I said, it's the problem with, you know, you look at the developing world, it's the problem, same problem everywhere. Well, you know, this is, uh, Lucy, the biggest challenge because we, uh, you know, we had sort of balanced our economy like most of the developing world. You know, COVID-19 hit us two years of, after three and a half years, two years was managing COVID-19 and its effects. And then, uh, you know, we had the commodity super cycle. Suddenly the energy prices skyrocketed. So not just Pakistan, but most of the developing worlds suffered from balance of payments issues because when the oil price during our time was between 110 to 115 dollars per barrel it's come down to 65 to 70 dollars so when, when the the prices went up so we too had problems but if you look at the economic survey of pakistan a year ago we had the best economic indicators in 17 years of pakistan's economic history and so we had managed to balance this. We got our country out of COVID-19, uh, uh, one of the top three 
three countries that manage the the the, uh, uh, the the virus, the corona effects of COVID-19, the best. We were rated as one of the best countries. And then we managed to pick up our economy. Now, we when they pulled the plug, you know, we had overshot all our targets that we had set, whether it was revenue collection, it was exports, it was remittances, uh, it was uh, agriculture and industrial output. So we were doing our best. But what happened was that after that, the new government came in, did not have a plan, markets lost confidence, political instability, because no one knew how, because the government maximum would have lasted for one and a half years. The elections were this autumn anyway. So that in that political instability and then total in then incompetence to handle the economic situation, give a roadmap. That's when we just the economy went into a tailspin. So we lost 35 percent of the value of our currency in, in, in 10 months. Well, you know, it, it is unfortunate the relationship between Pakistan and India. Uh, there's a lot of uh, arrogance in the way India now behaves in the cricketing world as a cricketing superpower. And, and, and because of their ability to generate a lot of funds, a lot more than any other country, I think they almost dictate now, you know, as a sort of the arrogance of a superpower of, you know, who they should play and who they shouldn't. And, and uh, I find it strange that the, that the Indian cricket board would take it out on the Pakistan cricket players. It's just reeks of arrogance. Uh, but Pakistan has now very good quality uh, Super League too. And, you know, foreign players come to Pakistan. And, uh, and I think that, you know, why if India doesn't allow Pakistan players, so be it. Pakistan should, you know, we have an excellent uh, a clutch of young cricketers coming up. And so we shouldn't worry about it. Look, I, you know, I haven't had much time to uh, watch cricket. To follow that. My life has sort of, you know, uh, hasn't given me the spare time in the last four years. But oh, I, 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 I read about the Yorkshire racism scandal. And look, uh, from the time I started and I'm, uh, you know, I started in 1971 as a, as a teenager. And from that time to when I when I was finishing cricket in the sort of mid 80s, I saw a transition, a change take place in England. There was a lot of open racism in English cricket and county cricket when I started. And by the end of my career, somehow, you know, if there was racism, it went undercover. You did not have overt racism by the time I finished in, in the sort of mid to late 80s. But when I started off, I mean, there were all the time racist remarks on the cricket field. Uh, it was, you know, even the Pakistanis, especially in the north of England, would suffer racism. There were these skinheads who were very, you know, anyone was a Paki and you know, they would abuse you in the streets. So it gra gradually began to change. And, you know, by the time I finished, there was much less racism.